it's great to be to be here with you. Greetings for everyone at Trinity. Um, some of you will have met some of the folks from Trinity at Gather last year, which was great to be together. I'm looking forward to that again in 2024. Hope you're going to sign up and come along next year. It'll be great to spend time together. But I know you as a church, you're in um, looking through uh, 2 Samuel. So if you've got a Bible, turn to uh, the second book of Samuel, chapter 16. All right, so it's 2 Samuel 16. That's what we're going to be looking at today. But did anyone watch Match of the Day last night? Come on, come on, be honest, who watched it? I never watch it, but I did last night. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. For those of you who haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, Match of the Day normally right, has all these people talking, and they seem to say the same thing every week about football, but they talk a lot about football, and they get paid lots and lots of money to talk about football. But they weren't there. It was just the football. It was just the goals. I like the goal bit. Yeah, I'm a rugby man more, so I was a bit disappointed over yesterday's rugby. But there we go. But I did watch the rugby, yeah. It was embarrassing, wasn't it? We won't go into that now. But, okay. Why was Match of the Day different? It was different because of a thing that's going on between Gary Lineker, who's the main presenter, and the BBC, that he overstepped the mark in a tweet that he put out uh, that they felt was too political and he's meant to be impartial and so they removed him from being on the show. And then Ian Wright and uh, was it, um, Alan Shearer said, well, we're not going to go on the show either. And then the commentators who would normally do all the talking about the match said, well, we're not going to do the commentary then. And it meant they had nothing. So they just showed the goals. What happened? All right, Gary Lineker said something and very quickly, he saw who his allies were, didn't he? He saw who his allies were. Alan Shearer said, I'm with you. All right. The commentator said, I'm with you. Even Pete Gregg. Now, if you don't know Pete Gregg, Pete Gregg is the guy that leads the 24-7 prayer movement. Leads a church in, in Guildford. He posted up and said, I'm with Gary. And explained his reasoning, which I thought were, were good reasons. There were good reasons. But he, the people stood with Gary Lineker and said, we're with you, we're allies. Okay, well, we're going to have a look at this whole thing of having an ally today. Conflicts arise, don't they? Conflicts arise. I don't know if they happen in your family over, over lunch. You start a conversation, you think it's going to just be go nice and easily, and then suddenly it turns and it becomes political, or it becomes uh, you know, some, about something like football teams, I don't know, whatever it might be, but it becomes a little bit tetchy, a little bit difficult. And then you're desperate to look around the dinner table, aren't you, that someone's going to be your ally and join with you and come on your side. And if you see someone a little bit weak in their argument, you go for them, don't you? You think, I'm going to get you, going to get you. We have it all the time, don't we? And we're looking for allies. No matter what the disagreement might be, just think about uh, President Zelensky. He is spending an awful lot of time building allies with other nations. A lot of his time is, is zooming in to political groups or where their parliaments are meeting and talking. He's trying to build alliances. He needs allies. When there's a war, when there's conflict, allies are really important, aren't they? Well, here in 2 Samuel... 2 Samuel chapter 16, we're in the middle of a terrible conflict between King David and his son, Absalom. It looks like civil war is going to break out. And not just civil war, but civil war between two family members. It's a terrible time. Will anyone support David, the king? Will anybody be his ally? Now, you need to understand that before David became king, there was another king, King Saul. And, and King Saul's reign came to an end, and, then da and David was anointed to take over as king. But at the time of chapter 16, there are descendants of Saul still around. Who will they side with? Who will they go with? Will they go with David? who they really saw as the person who pushed their king out? Or will they go with Absalom, the usurper? 
Well, chapter 16 gives us a little glimpse in what happens. So David is fleeing. All right, he's fleeing the city. Absalom is arriving with, uh, with armies and he's ready to take over. And so David flees his beloved palace, his beloved city, his beloved people. And some go with him. Some of his servants and his family and some of his soldiers go with him and they're escaping. All right? And he meets some people on the way. He meets some people as he is escaping. He goes across the Kidron Valley and he goes up over the Mount of Olives. And it's here we pick up the story. The first person David meets is a man called Zeba. Zeba was a servant of King Saul back in the day. And now he serves uh, the grandson of Saul. His name is Mephibosheth. Sadly now, Mephibosheth, uh, he has a young child when his granddad and his dad, Jonathan, were killed in battle. But a nurse carried him to safety, away from the battle, but, but dropped him and really damaged his legs. So the fact he couldn't walk, he was lame. But Ziba, no longer now serving King Saul, decided to serve Mephibosheth and was a servant of Mephibosheth. Let's have a look. This is the beginning of chapter 16. When David had passed a little beyond the summit, Ziba, the servant of Meshibapheth, met him with a couple of donkeys saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, 100 bunches of raisins, 100 of summer fruits, uh, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, why have you brought these? Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. The bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. Initial reading, is Zebra an ally or not? Well, it feels like he probably is, isn't it? He's brought provisions. You know, an army can't go far without supplies, can it? We've seen that in the Ukraine war. All right? When, when the, the supply chain is broken, the army at the front doesn't last long. They need provisions to survive. And God graciously provides David and his people with provisions. Now, David is not only grateful to God for this, he also wants to thank Mephibosheth for the generosity. Because clearly they must have come from him. So this is verse 3. And the king said, And where's your master's son? I asked Mephibosheth, where is he? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he remains in Jerusalem. For he said, today the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom of my father. Zeba the servant implies that this grandson of Saul, the one who David had been so kind to earlier in the story, is now waiting in Jerusalem, waiting to see David and Absalom annihilate each other with the hope that he can take back the kingship. Is he an ally? Hmm. Verse 4, then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth, so, God, so David had given him everything from Saul, he said, all that belonged to him, oh wow, do you know what? Is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage, let me ever find favour in your sight, my lord the king. Because the report, the report that David gets from Ziba, that Mephibosheth is not going to be his ally, it appears that Zeba has done it all on his own back, given these resources, given the donkeys and the food. But sadly, it happens time and time again. When you're in a dis desperate situation, like David is in, fleeing for his life, not everyone is as honest as you'd hope, are they? Sadly. If we jump forward a few chapters, right, once Absalom has been dealt with, sorry to spoil the story, but once he's been dealt with and David's restored as a throne, we discover that Ziba hadn't been as completely honest as he should have been. Right? Mephibosheth hadn't planned to double-cross David at all, it seems. Ziba is an example of someone who's wickedly using a crisis for his own benefit. He hears that the kingdom's in turmoil, that the son has turned against father. So what does he do? He turns up, tries to get a vantage point. 
I think it's a wicked heart that does that. You see, when you see someone else is down, whether that's within your own family, whether it's in work, whether it's in the church, don't see if you can get one over them. Don't seek to benefit from their misfortune. Well, the story develops, and you can look at it yourselves to see how it goes. Um, but David tries to deal with all that later on in, in the book. But it seems that even though Zeba's motives might not have been correct and honourable, God still used him to bless David. It reminds me of that, that bit in Joseph, the Joseph in Genesis. You know, when, when the, sons, the brothers have sold him into slavery, haven't they? And, and then have a terrible time, he's in prison and all that, and then he becomes the second in command in Egypt. And when his relationship with his brothers is restored, Joseph says this wonderful thing, he says, what you intended for harm, God intended for good. God, God intended that for good. And I think it's the same here. Zeba actually was trying to get in there, but God still used it for good. Was Zeba an ally? I'm not sure if he really was. And then we get another one, turns up. All right, Shimmy. I think that's why I'm going to pronounce, I'm pronounce it Shimmy. Is that all right? Is that okay, Aaron? Have I got it right? Excellent. Good. Shimmy. Shimmy turns up. This is verse 5. All right, Shimmy was, um, he was a descendant of King Saul again. So is he going to be an ally? Well, when King David came to Bahurim, there came out of a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimmy, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right and on his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you've reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Just like Zeba, Shimei knew David was in trouble, didn't he? So he saw this as an opportunity to attack. He cursed him, he threw stones at him. Sadly, there are always people ready to rejoice when a leader falls. The ones who say, oh, I saw it coming. Oh, yeah, I saw it coming. I, I never rated them much anyway. I think many of us fall into that sometimes. We find delight in the failings of others. These feelings of anger and hatred towards David that Shimei had were most likely festering for quite some time. Right? But he didn't have the courage to show it until David was at his lowest point. A cowardly act. And often... Our response when we have someone attack us like that can be to attack back, can't it? We can go, we come back full force. We get angry. We want to want to push them down. We don't want to hear it. But how did David respond? Well, we'll look at that in a minute. But let's just think about Shimmy for a moment. Shimmy wasn't intent. He wasn't trying to kill David. All right. He wasn't really attacking him at all. He wanted to shame David. He wanted to shame him. All right? David was fleeing. David didn't look anything like a king in this moment. He was pretty down. It looked like he was going to lose everything, probably his life. And as David looked at his own predicament, it would have been so easy for David's head to drop and for him to begin to believe the lie that Shimei was saying. That he didn't really have the, the anointing of God at all. That God was against him. That God was destroying him. How often when we face trials, difficulties, perhaps when we get really sick, or relationships go sour, or the work situation messes up, that we can let our heads drop. And we can say, I, I didn't really deserve the blessing anyway, really. If any of you knew me, you'd know I didn't deserve it. I bet God's punishing me for something. It's so easy for us to fall into that. Outward appearances made it feel like Shimmy was right, didn't it? 
But in many ways, Shimei's wrong. Because David has always treated Saul and his family with love and graciousness. David always did that. All right? Always treated Saul and his family well. See, David was not a man of blood. Yes, he was a man of war, but he wasn't bloodthirsty. And it actually wasn't David who brought Saul to ruin. Saul brought Saul to ruin. It was the choices Saul made. But in some sense, Shimei, Shimei was right. What David was experiencing now in this moment was because of the will of God. And it was linked to David's terrible actions. I know you've looked at this a bit. When he had Uriah killed on the battlefield and he violated Bathsheba. Shimei was wrong, but he was also right. And that often, that's what often happens in life, isn't it? Often happens. When others attack us, there are often grains of truth in the accusations. But they get embellished and exaggerated. And they kind of get lost in it. Do you know, leaders face criticism. All of you are leaders in some sense. You lead your own life. If you've got influence in anybody else, you're a leader. But, you know, we do face criticism as leaders. It goes with the territory. All right, as Payman said, I was head teacher for 18 years. I can tell you now, not every decision and policy I put in place was liked by everyone in the school. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. There's no way you could do that. Whether we're in church, work, leading our families, we all need to be aware that sometimes criticism gets dished out, doesn't it? It does. And often within it, there is some element of truth. They might have seen a flaw in the plan. Or they might recognise a little bit of a wrong motive in what we're trying to do. But how the criticism is bought can make or break a person receiving it. And can make or break your relationship with them too. And it determines whether that element of truth within it is really heard. Back to Shimmy. What does Shimmy get right? Well, this calamity that David's writing at this moment is from the Lord. But not because of the reason Shimmy thinks. It's not because of how David treated Saul and his family, but because of the murder of Uriah and the taking of his wife, Bathsheba. How does David respond in this moment? Well, before David could respond, one of his men steps forward. This is verse 9. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. Surely this would be a fair response, wouldn't it? We need to shut Shimmy up. Take off his head. Remember, the men with David were, were hardened, seasoned warriors. They knew how to fight. Verse 10, but the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he's cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamin? Leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. Often, we want to deal with adversity right, by saying, well, I don't really deserve that. That's not right. Or we want to quash it. But here we see David receive adversity with humility. A humble heart faces adversity by saying, it's all in the Lord's hands. I will take whatever the Lord gives me. Had Shimei been told by God to say what he said, to curse David? Well, we don't really know. But David looked at that situation and he concluded that God was allowing it to happen. David knew that God was able to deal with Shimei. He didn't need the soldiers to cut off his head. If we ever find ourselves 
facing criticism. Let's do it with humility. If you're the kind of person that recognises in yourself that you are quite a critical person, and there are some of us around, aren't I, like that, can I make a suggestion? Let others bring the criticism <laughs> than yourself. If you find you're bitter and you're resentful, like Shimmy, and you find yourself, actually, it's going to come out quite aggressive, and actually, I'm, I've got my emotions so wrapped up in this that it's not going to go well. Do you know what? Take that to God first before you try and deal with the problem with the person. That's what Shimmy should have done. See, David, a wise, godly man, was willing to hear what Shimmy had to say because within it there was some truth and perhaps God would bless him. Perhaps God would bless him. I want to make one final observation. The king, all right, David, fleeing from Jerusalem, escaping with a few people, having to face uh, Zeba, oh, great, provisions, that's good. This could be going well. Oh, this is okay, God's with us. Oh, no, shimmy, accusing me, throwing stones at me, shaming me. Well, they make their journey, and then we get to verse 14. This is what it says. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. And there he refreshed himself. David, amidst all that was going on, is able to find rest. It's amazing. David leads his people well in this moment. Even through this terrifying time of, of fleeing. I think... You know, David wrote many of the Psalms, didn't he? Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David could find rest even in that challenging times. When we face trials, you know, there's a danger, isn't there, that we, we can, can exclude ourselves from comfort and rest. We do it. We let the issue become a nagging worry in us. It robs us of sleep. It, it, it takes up all our thinking space. It makes us titchy and, and sometimes quick-tempered with the ones we truly love. But what we really need to do in those moments of real challenge and difficulty is learn to rest in God. Learn to rest in him like David did. Do you know, such, so much of this story of David is a foretaste, it's a glimpse at the story of Jesus. Jesus, the descendant king of David, the king of kings. Yeah, you know, David is, is outcast from the city. That's my granddaughter, ignore her, she's fine. All right. David is outcast from the city of all right? By the people. They're kicking him out. They've turned against him. Jesus was outcast from the city, same city, by the people. Who should we release? Jesus or Barabbas? Barabbas, crucify him. They outcast Jesus from the city. David travels across the Kidron Valley over the Mount of Olives. Jesus, the night before he's arrested, or the night he's arrested, he goes across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. So many similarities. All right, insults and stones are thrown at David by Shimei. Jesus faced insults, false accusations, beatings, lashes with a whip, a cross on his back, nails in his hand. David puts his trust in God even through this difficult season of life. Well, all of Jesus' life was lived totally in trust of his father, wasn't it? All right? And leading up to the moment of crucifixion. You see, unlike David, Jesus had done no wrong. So when Shimon is accusing David, David's like, well, there might be a, glimmer, there might be a little bit of truth in this. 
I'm, I've broken. I, I, I've, I've acted terribly. I'm a sinner. I perhaps deserve a bit of this. Jesus was pure and innocent and holy without sin. David finds rest even in turmoil. And Jesus knew the best place for him to be as he's preparing for that traumatic moment of his own death was to go and be with his father and to pray and find rest in his father. And David leads his people to rest. He got them out. He got them to the Jordan and they rested. He cared for them. Do you know, Jesus doesn't offer to lead us to a place of rest, to an oasis in a desert or, or to water and to a table. Do you know what? He says, I am your rest. I am your rest. Jesus is our rest. Come to me all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites us through all our life, but particularly in those moments of desperation, to find our rest in him. David had got to a place where all had been stripped away. All right? The only thing he had left was God. When all we have left is God, when God is our only hope, although it can be very painful and a scary place to be at times, do you know, it's actually a merciful experience. It truly is. It's in these moments where we see our own weaknesses, our own vulnerabilities so clearly. It's in the season like this where enduring faith is really forged. When as we look back, we see that God truly was our rock, our only hope. Just think about it as parents. We live in an age in parenting where you're meant to remove all obstacles from your children's lives. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Let them go through struggle. Let them go through times where they perhaps haven't quite got enough money to buy the thing they really want and to learn how to work for that. Let them go through difficult times with friends. Don't just remove them from it. Help them through it. Because that's when they learn to go deep into God. Yeah, we do it all the time. We just try and make it all lively and easy and it doesn't prepare them for the world. Do you know, these moments, although tough, can be some of the sweetest moments of our lives. Moments of mercy. So just going to get the band to come up. They'll come up, we're going to worship. But I just, just want to say this. Do you know what? Did David find any allies? Well, Shimmy definitely wasn't. I don't think Zeba really was. But he had an ally in heaven. He had God. And you know what? There is an ally in the throne room of heaven right now, sat next to his father. Do you know what he's doing? He is interceding for you right now. He is, he is praying about you. He's mentioning you by name to the Father in heaven right now. The greatest ally, the perfect one, the Saviour, the Lord of all, the King of Kings, Jesus. Beth, do you want to just play for me? I just want to read a psalm. I'm going to finish and then they're going to sing. But I just want to read a psalm. It's Psalm 62. I don't know whether David wrote this as a response to... Um, to what happened on that escape. I don't know. But, but I just think it will help us understand. Listen to this. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? 
They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone. Oh, my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. And I think as the psalmist was singing this, they turned to the congregation for this next bit. So this is to you. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. They're just gone. Those of high estate, they're just a delusion. In the balance they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you O Lord belongs steadfast love for you will render to a man according to his work David knew this my prayer is that each one of us would know this on God rests my salvation and my glory on God my mighty rock and it's in those times of desperation that I realise he is a rock my mighty rock my refuge is God So I call to you, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him, for God is a refuge for us.